the heart of the Sahara, national frontiers are often flimsy affairs. I'm in a no man's land, near Ingazam, on the border between Niger and Algeria. These chunks of scrap metal seek to assure me that I'm about to cross the dividing line between two of the largest countries in the Sahara. It's a terrible anticlimax, a scribble in the concrete. It reminds me of a tombstone, and maybe that's appropriate for this whole godforsaken area, haunt of smugglers and bandits, feels like a graveyard. No point waiting around for customs. Goodbye, Niger. Hello, Algeria. It's time to unwind and look around. Algeria, 10th largest country in the world, is 85% desert. Dangerous desert. As many have discovered to their cost, driving here is not a right, it's a test of survival. The soft sand is treacherous, the temperature's scorching, and failure can be fatal. The route from the Niger border up into Algeria is absolutely littered with the bleached carcasses of vehicles that set out to cross the Sahara and never made it. It's so bleak and pitiless here that uh, what might be a routine problem elsewhere, like running out of fuel or a mechanical problem, becomes a matter of life and death. This was the area where Mark Thatcher went missing. He was only discovered after an enormous rescue operation. And other people just weren't so lucky. They paid for their mistakes with their lives. The desert does weird things to your sense of reality. As we head north, the shady rocks and cool lakes on the horizon turn out to be mirages. Nothing more than a trick of the light. This wholly edible non-mirage of fresh tomatoes and not-so-fresh tuna is real enough, but it's accompanied by, well, a pretty rum coincidence. I'm writing up my diary, miles from anywhere, when I bump into the only other Englishman in southern Algeria. Or rather, he, poor man, bumps into us. The number plate is the first clue. The lone Mercedes belongs to Tom Shepard. And no, it isn't a mirage. Tom Shepard is something of a legend out here. He's a 68-year-old ex-RAF test pilot who travels the desert, writing books, taking photos, and devoting much time and effort to getting away from people. Well, I'm on my own, yeah. I've come, come down really from the north of, of Algeria, from, uh, from Tunisia, and I'm, I'm you know, going very carefully around the old, old routes, the old French uh, tracks. When, you, when you're, when you're travelling, you're, you're on your own, what do you eat? What do you survive on? I had a, a, a birth boat two days ago, and I had a really special meal on, on that one, actually. Meat and two veg, mm. chilled grapefruit, for goodness sake, you know, with a, a, a damp kitchen towel uh, and the... The dryness of the air makes evaporation and you get cool, cool grapefruit segments. So, you know, what more could you ask for a birthday? Does loneliness worry you? It's, uh, I must say, it's been more lonely than I expected. You know, the last uh, session was about eight days uh, between, uh, you know, seeing one human being and seeing the neck. Eight, eight days on the track. I didn't expect it to be that long. Does that, <laughs> that no worry you? Uh, loneliness kind no, of No, it's just so beautiful to be out there. You know, you get such a, a lift from the from the countryside. Every morning you think, well, I've exhausted the pictures I can take. And then suddenly the next morning you think, look up and think, oh, my God, look at that. And, and, and so it goes. And that's what the desert has always been for me, you know. Do you ever meet... 40 years of it now. 40 years? Yeah. You've been coming to this, to the Sahara particularly? To the Sahara, yeah, one way or another. This is my actually my lucky 13th visit to Algeria. We're just going to have some, um, we're having some lunch. Would you like to join us? Are you well, it's very kind of you, but I, I, I've got to be on my way now, actually. <laughs> but just kind of. Good for Tom. Anyone who can be that busy in a place like this wins my respect. Maybe it was the tuna. As Tom hurries south, we head north into the weird and wonderful Hogger Mountains, one of the most bizarre landscapes in the Sahara. It's 
like riding through a giant sculpture park. The hard cores of extinct volcanoes form a panorama of bluffs and spires and pinnacles. These are young peaks, their sides deeply scarred by the explosive force of their creation. The Tuareg call this land Atacor, like something out of Lord of the Rings. Next morning, I climbed to the top of a 9,000-foot mountain to watch the sunrise. Because of Algeria's 10-year civil war, the Hogar Massif is rarely visited, which only increases the impact of its beauty. Down in the dormitory where we spent the night, it's time to pack up. Our newly acquired sense of peace is about to be rudely shattered. This is the other face of Algeria, a modern republic which freed itself from the French and is now desperately trying to free itself from Islamic radicals. But airlines and newspapers can't disguise underlying tensions or the fact that these 21st century comforts are paid for by one great stroke of fortune. This is Algeria's Aladdin's cave, oil and natural gas fields that provide 90% of the country's foreign earnings. They've spawned high security towns in the middle of nowhere, like this one at Hassi Massoud. 45 years ago, there was nothing here but desert. And this amazing transformation is the result of electric pumps working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to pump water up from vast underground reservoirs, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of feet below the Sahara. The result is a man-made oasis and this extraordinary and powerful illusion that in the middle of the desert, there is no desert. It's not just like being in a French provincial town, but French countryside as well. These are very different cattle from their bony counterparts in Mali and Niger. It just shows what can be done to the desert if there's a will and a petrochemical industry to back it up. A few miles from where they first discovered the oil that so changed Algeria's fortunes, there is another frontier. On the other side of it, an even richer country. Shukran, shukran. This lonely tree represents the border between Algeria and Libya. And apart from being one of the most spectacular frontiers in the world, it's also one of the friendliest frontiers. Because people from Algeria and people from Libya come here, sit under the tree and, um, and take tea. And really, I don't want to leave this beautiful spot, but um, leave we must across the border into the sands of Libya. In Libya, like Algeria, the bulk of the population clings to the Mediterranean coast. It's been quite a coup to get permission to film here, and I'm not going to miss a minute of it. Well, maybe just a minute. This looks like being one of the longest bus rides of my life. To all appearances, Libya is a country with plenty of money, but very few people. Which is not surprising, as they have the world's third largest oil revenues to divide amongst a population less than that of London. In Benghazi, Libya's second city, you can see the layers of history. A mosque stands beside a palazzo built by Italian colonists, 
which now houses one of the committees which run the great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. It feels sleepy, but 60 years ago this coastline was one of the great Second World War battlefields. The British garrison in Tobruk has more to contend with than just Germans and Italians. Choking sandstorms are part of the daily round, but they don't interfere with the real job to destroy the enemy. Uh, it's the most tremendous battle. It was a, a real turning point. And I think you know, we mustn't forget these things. If you forget your history, it comes back and hits you in the back of the neck. Over the last few years, Lady Avril Randall has organised regular reunions for desert rats and their relatives. Today, they're at Tobruk. Survivors, now in their 80s, remember what it was like to be trapped here. There were no girls, there were no bars. There were no, it was just desert. And to spend from the age of 20, 21, 22 in that sort of environment, I hate it. Food? Well, it, it was uh, corned beef, bully beef, in one uh, form or another. We were we, down to about uh, a cup of water a day or, or so, and that was for everything. A cup and of yet, water? And yet, the surprising thing was, none of us grew beards. Highlight of the reunion is the floating of a wreath into the harbour these men defended for so long. If they'd lost this vital supply line, the Allied army in Africa would have faced almost certain defeat. There was nothing inside the garrison mm -hmm. at all, only ammunition and, uh, and men, mm -hmm. and so they had to bring all our food, or our supplies uh, up, and they had to get it in here somehow. Rommel said that the desert was a tactician's paradise and a quartermaster's nightmare, and that was the fact. You could, it was like a, a naval battle at sea with the tanks, great fleets of tanks here and there. But if the petrol didn't get there and the ammunition didn't get there, you were in trouble. There were 25,000 of us in here, all, and that's where we won the name, rats, you know. Uh, ho, 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 used to say, come out of your holes, you rats. Uh, well, we did eventually. We came out a bit too quick for him, eventually. It's unlikely that any of these desert rats will see Tobruk again. It's a long way, and they're not getting any younger. Today is probably the last time they'll celebrate the efforts of all those who gave Hitler the first bloody nose of the war and one from which he never recovered. What's been the high point of this trip for you? I think the, the last march past of the old rats with the bugler and the piper and the rats of Tobruk Association standard. There's a rat. Do your duties. This, this. The boys can now march off into the sunset. You'll never see them again. Modern Libya has often cut itself off from the West, but over 2,000 years ago, it was an integral part of Europe. First the Greeks, then the Romans were drawn to this fertile land between the sea and the Sahara and built some of their grandest cities here. Cyrene was a bustling metropolis 500 years before Christ. It had its own port, Apollonia. Staggering sights these, but totally deserted. but then the modern towns are deserted as well. Is there some national emergency we've not been told about? Is it National Stay Indoors Day? Where are all the Libyans? Apart from our driver, everyone seems to have gone and taken everything with them.
picnic time, and despite the fact that uh, there are big cities, we've seen Tobruk and Benghazi, we're off to Tripoli, Libya is largely desert, so it's picnic time in the desert. Here's my pack lunch, it's enormous, and I can't actually tell what it is because uh, everything's in Arabic. Typically all the signs uh, in Libya are in Arabic as well, despite the fact that a lot of people here speak English. So it could be lunch, it could be a very large hat, I suppose. It is lunch. There we go. Now, nice little well-sealed box here. Ah, definitely very typically Libyan. Got some cold chips. The shortage of water is clearly a problem for Libya, but Colonel Gaddafi has an impressive answer to it. These massive concrete sections will form part of his great man-made river project designed to bring underground water a thousand miles from the desert to the coast. It's one of the most ambitious engineering schemes anywhere in the world. Seventeen hundred years ago, water was no problem. This land was known as the breadbasket of Rome, rich enough from exports of wheat and oil to boast the most magnificent city of North Africa, Leptis Magna. It still gives off a powerful sense of the brute strength of Rome. These halls were built by Septimius Severus, an African who became Roman Emperor and died attending to business in the north of England. It wasn't just Septimius that ended up in England. In 1827, the ruler of Tripoli sent 35 columns and other assorted features as a present to King George IV. A bit of Leptis Magna can still be found off the A329 near Virginia Water. I'm told the amphitheatre at Leptis Magna has the best acoustics in North Africa. Well, there's only one way to find out. I'm leaning on the lamppost at the corner of the street until a certain little lady come by. Oh me, oh my, I hope that little lady passes by. She's absolutely wonderful and absolutely marvellous and lots of people ask me just why. I'm standing on the corner of the corner of the street until a certain little lady passes by. Get off, get off, get off. <laughs> As we leave Libya, I have the feeling that despite being generous hosts, the Libyans are deeply mistrustful of people with cameras, something which was never a problem in my next destination. Less than a hundred miles from the Libyan border, we're in this extraordinary arid, almost lunar landscape of southern Tunisia. Um, and it's so arid and uncongenial here that for the last 700 years people have been living in caves under the ground. And believe it or not, I do know this place. I was crucified here 23 years ago for the life of Brian. And I've always wanted to come back because it is so unforgettable, a place that remains in your mind. And I mean, there aren't many people who can say they've gone back to the place they were crucified. I'm going to see what it's like. The crosses are gone, but otherwise El Hadej hasn't changed much. It remains an underground town, and though the authorities are doing their best to move people from caves into houses, there are those who by tradition and inclination prefer to live and work below the surface. The older generation of troglodytes can't see why they should have to move from their caves. One answer is to cash in on the curiosity value and become hoteliers. Bonjour, Michael. Beautiful. This is where you live, your house. Yes. Hmm. Nice and silent and cut off from the world. You have a room? Ah, yes. Okay, I see the room. Thank you. Ah. In here? Right. Ah, yeah, see. Up ah. My host was very keen to point out that living underground made very good sense, as the caves are warm in winter and cool in summer. Mm, I think tea is made. Yeah, that's what this. Manu 
My own Arabic being limited, I rely on the one word I know and repeat it as often as possible. Thank you. Shokran. 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 My little Arabic that I know, so a little nuts as well. Thank you. We've been right around the Sahara. And one thing that doesn't change is the tea. The method of making the tea seems to be the same in every country we've been to. From Morocco to Mali to Mauritania to Tunisia. Good. Thank you. Chop around. Very nice. In southern Tunisia, where the desert meets the sea, there's an offshore island called Jerba, which hangs on to old traditions as tenaciously as the troglodytes of El Hadej. In their case, it's catching octopus in Greek vases. The fishermen may look as if they're dressed by Dolce and Gabbana, but their technique is pre-Roman. The pots are strung out on a line and, unfailingly, between November and March every year, the octopus obligingly climb into them. Oh, good one. Yes. We. Well, that's it. That's what it looks like. Can we have a look? Good. Look at it. Oh, there it is. Wow. Whoa. Do you want it? <laughs> no, no, no. Hey. That's one. So. They're all over the place. Okay, well there's two. One's about to be crawling up your leg now. But, uh, there's that one. Yeah, bang in. Oh, thank you. There. I'm not much good at octopus wrangling, but I'm learning. Oh my god! Another! Getting him out of the sea is the easy bit. Keeping him on board. Look at that. I love these. It's sad because I love living in these little bowls. These little urns. Obviously there's a synchronicity between the octopus and the urn. And here we are. Ripping them out. So I'm not going to have any more to do with this. Thank you. To start the octopus protection league. Gerba claims to be the island of the lotus eaters, to which Ulysses and his weary sailors came to be seduced by the narcotic delights of the lotus. There's no lotus left, but Gerba still manages to seduce thousands of foreigners every year. <laughs> Let's 
tourism is now the biggest business in Jerba. I walk round the souk with El Hajj, who runs one of the better shops in town. Though there was hardly a tourist in sight when he was a boy, he now relies on them for 70 to 80 percent of his business. Do you think tourism can have a, a, um, a bad effect, an adverse effect? Um, of course, yeah, it didn't well. bring only good things, it brought a lot of money to Jerba, but uh, we have uh, other problems. Uh, What's a lot of problems. Well, we have a lot of our young people who, who change, uh, they are not practicing their religion anymore, they are uh, uh, running after, uh, <laughs> I don't know. How Seduced to, uh, by the money. Uh, yeah, exactly. We have this, uh, I don't know if I want, uh, <laughs> maybe I don't want to talk about it, but this sex tourism, we have a lot of old ladies, they're coming here to, to find a young friend here. This, uh, this is good. Uh, that's not good, of course. Mm. It's, it's one of, of the bad sides. You find some, uh, sometimes some homosexuals, or they are, you, go to the, you just go to the beach beside Julius Palace and you see that uh, there are people staying there waiting for an, an old lady or, uh, or we also have a lot of young people, they don't want to work because they have a German rate. I don't know, I don't want to say, uh, but old, old ladies, uh, they leave their husbands there or they don't have a husband anymore and they come here to, to find a friend here and so they give him, they buy him or they, they pay him. Mm -hmm. So th this is one of the bad side of tourism. But Tunisia, lacking the oil reserves of Libya and Algeria, has to do all it can to make tourists welcome. Their efforts have been greatly helped by the Romans, who at El Gem left behind the third biggest amphitheatre they ever built. Whilst at Duga, graceful temples overlook a purpose-built brothel, and next door to it, a masterpiece of imperial plumbing. The Romans certainly weren't bashful about uh, bodily functions. Um, this is a public lavatory in the truest sense of the word, in that there are 12 little uh, toilets here, and it was a communal lavvy, so you went in, they were called foraki, and you paid one, <laughs> believe it or not, one ass uh, to come in here, which is a tiny, tiny little coin. And um, they would sit here, and uh, that would be a group thing. You'd discuss the weather, what's going on, you know, politics, um, acting, life, architecture. Uh, digestion, and there'd be water running around this little runnel here. It's very, very convenient, so you could sort of wash your hands there and uh, bring the water up, and then apparently you put your hand under there and sort of wash the bits like that. You see, it's absolutely beautifully done. Everything was done with cold water, though, so it must have been a bit of a freezing, freezing jobby here, but, uh, I mean, the Romans were kind of oddly civilised in this uh, insanitary way, I think. Not just Romans, but Phoenicians, Turks, Greeks, even Normans have all contributed to Tunisia's rich racial mix. But most influential were the Arabs. One of their great monuments is in Monastir, and the locals never stopped talking about the day when Monty Python came to film here. Believe it or not, though, this is the, the more comfortable parts of the filming that weren't um, done on crosses happened here in, in Monastir, and this is the the Rebat, which is it's a very, very old building, probably about 1,300 years old, and this is where um, most of the scenes of Life of Brian were done. And I'm, I'm just trying to remember it because it all looks very tidy and very neat at the moment. Um, yeah, it's coming back to me now. I think the stoning scene, the bits where, where the stoning and we all dressed up as uh, women were not allowed to go to stoning. It's always only women who were allowed to go to stoning. So, uh, women weren't allowed to go to stoning, so we all played women with beards. Who threw that? Was it you? Yes. Right. Well, you did say Jehovah. <laughs> now, this does bring it back. The tower, Graham Chapman, ran up, got to the top, the stairs ran out, and he's rescued highly and probably by a flying saucer and goes on. I think we must have just taken over this place entirely for about two months, which seems unlikely. Um, and up there, where those sort of girls are coming down, just above that, I think was the, 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 the sort of columns were built where 
uh, Pontius Pilate came out and there was all the release Wadwick and uh, he wags higher than any in the womb and all that sort of stuff was done up there. But it's, it's difficult to tell because we added bits on and we added pillars there and we added columns, we added sort of great coloured flags. But I think I seem to remember coming out about that, above that bit there. A very strange and rather effective moment where the power of Rome was challenged not by people fighting but by people laughing. That was the great, that's what sort of moved me about it, that once people laughed at him there's nothing he could do and I was like, well laughter's a very, very good weapon. Uh, not used nearly enough but it was literally used there. As soon as they started giggling, lying on their backs, screaming with laughter, then uh, he got very, very, very angry and made a very great fool of himself. Silence! <laughs> this man commands a quack legion! <laughs> he wags as high as any in Rome! Along the coast from Monastir is the city of Sousse, in which Brian also came to life. It seems strangely subdued today. I remember the streets of the old town as the liveliest in Tunisia, but now they're quiet as the grave. In the main square, they're already shutting up shop for the day. The reason I learn is that this is the start of Ramadan, the one month every year when Muslims are expected to fast during daylight hours. Candy stores do a roaring trade in anticipation of nighttime feasts. I've heard it said that some people actually put on weight during the month of fasting. Now I can understand why. Tunisia likes to see itself as secular and outward looking. It's also the only Islamic country in which it's not compulsory to observe Ramadan. But most do. And with my friend Moez, I visit a cafe to see how the country makes the most of the hours of darkness. Moez orders a chicha, which is basically a cigarette the size of a vacuum cleaner. Charcoal heats honey flavoured tobacco, and the air is cooled by the water. Uh, do you want to uh, try it? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So just... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. It's very relaxing, isn't it? Would you normally smoke this? Sometimes, yeah. Especially in uh, Ramadan. People, after, after eating and everything, they like to relax, to have a cup of tea, and to smoke the tea shisha. Are you allowed to smoke at all during during Ramadan, during the day? No, nothing. N nothing. No water, no smoking, nothing in your mouth. You know. that's really? That's no. very hard. Just air, you know. Maybe. Yeah. What is the, what, I mean, what is the worst thing, you know, to, to be deprived of? Is it, is it water? Is it food? Is it smoke? For me, it's water. For some people, it's, it's uh, food. It depends, you know, each person. Uh, some people it's smoking too. Huh? The, yeah. It's the hardest thing for them is to stop <coughs> smoking uh, for 12 hours. You know? Does it make people bad tempered? Yeah, some people are bad tempered, you know, but some people are uh, not. If they are a bad temper, they are a bad temper. In Ramadan or not, it's not Ramadan. But some people they find it easy. They say, ah, I am a bad temper because it's Ramadan. But it's not. Uh, <laughs> some people they are using it excuse, as, yeah. Yeah, as, an, um, as an excuse. Apart from the Arabs, most of those who invaded North Africa stopped short of the Sahara. The Romans never crossed it, and one of the most famous occupying empires looked only towards the sea. They were the Carthaginians, and their power base was right here. In fact, the station's called Carthage. Well, this is the start of my journey, hopefully, through to Algeria. Um, 
This is a little local train which will take me to Tunis Nord, which is the uh, main station in Tunis, from which I can get a train called the Trans Maghreb Express. Excuse me, please, I'm working. The Trans Maghreb Express, uh, which will take me through to Algiers. And this line goes to some wonderful stations. There's a Carthage Animal Car, Carthage Residence, Carthage Hannibal, great name for a station. Carthage Dear Me, Carthage Bursa. So five Carthage stations. Whatever the Romans might think, Carthage is not destroyed. I think when the Romans left Carthage, they, they, they were so fed up with the Carthaginians attacking Rome and Hannibal bringing his elephants over that they actually sowed the fields with salt so nothing would grow after that. From the main station in Tunis, it looks easy enough to continue my journey across North Africa aboard the Trans Maghreb Express. The Arab word Maghreb means the lands of the setting sun, the lands of the West. But there are problems ahead. Tunisia, the country I'm leaving, is international, outward-looking and relatively stable. Algeria, the country I'm going to, has been caught in a spiral of violence since 1992. Foreign Office advice is unequivocal. The security situation remains serious. We advise against all holiday and non-essential travel to Algeria. At first sight, Algiers seems little different from any other modern city. The trains seem to be running on time, there are no porters at the station, and my hotel, the Al Jazeera, is rather grand. It was formerly called the St George, and was built in the 1880s to accommodate all those fashionable Victorians who flocked to Algiers to benefit from the healthy climate. No one flocks to Algiers anymore, and I can't even leave the hotel without a bodyguard. Beyond the hotel, uh, we will be required to uh, travel around Algiers with a team of the service. The particular this is Eamon, and he's an ex Marine commando. The reason that we need this uh, security in place is that since 1992, uh, foreigners in Algeria have been under fatwa by certain extreme Islamic groups. Oh, really? Fatwa, not the sort of same as in the Salman Rushdie Salman Rushdie, yeah. yes, the satanic verses, yeah. And um, the result is that over 100 foreigners have been killed in Algeria since that time. I've travelled quite a bit, and as far as I know, no one's ever tried to kill me. I ask yeah. Eamon if this is all strictly <laughs> necessary. Well, it is. You're a public figure with a high profile, and frankly, if I lose you, I lose my job. Well, that really won't be a problem. Out on the streets, you could be mistaken for thinking you were in Lyon or Marseille. For a hundred years, the French treated Algeria not as a colony, but as a part of France itself. As a result, the independence movement was resisted more fiercely here than anywhere in North Africa. Said Chitour, a local journalist, is proud of the fight his people put up and is prepared to take me to what was the centre of the struggle, the ancient heart of Algiers, the Kasbah. As the streets of the Kasbah are still a flashpoint for violent protest, the local police, known as the Kasbah Cops, have thrown a comprehensive but discreet cordon around the area for our visit. So successful is this precaution, that there's absolutely no one about. And even when someone eventually appears, he's one of the local police regrouping. But they can't keep out the ghosts of old heroes. Ali Lapointe was one of the resistance uh, fighters against the French, wasn't he, he? I mean, he was in the film yeah. Battle of Algiers with these yeah. narrow streets. Yeah. Did he live here? He lived here with his uh, friends, uh, like Hasiba Ben Bali and all the, those uh, uh, freedom fighters and he was one of the famous resistance, a hero of the Caspa and the Battle of Algiers. So the resistance, was it centred on the Caspa? Yes. Right. So w it was pretty difficult to get for the, for the French to come in and get the, the revolutionaries out of here. Very right. difficult because it's uh, roof to roof, 
house to house. It's difficult, and the people, they can jump from roof to roof. Uh -huh. This is the uh, memorial plate in memory of Ali Lapuan. So what does the plaque say, uh, Said? Uh, in the 8, uh, October the 8th, uh, 1957, Ali Lapointe, with his companion, uh, uh, spent all the day resisting to the French paratrooper of Bijar and Massu. Uh -huh. And uh, in the end, the uh, French army decided to blow up the house. He didn't uh, want uh, to uh, give up, and he died. Yeah, that's, that's the scene in the film where they give them the chance to come out. Yes. And they decide to stay in there, yes. saying, right, we're going to give you one yeah. hour. Yeah. And, and then, then they blew the place up. They blew it. Lapointe and these people achieved? Freedom, independence for, for us, for the generation who are coming after 1962. Now this place became a, a kind of center, training center for young girls yeah. of the Kasbah to teach okay. them how to, to make a good couscous. Yeah, <laughs> couscous, that's a bit of a <laughs> sublime to the ridiculous. This Kasbah sounds like it's coming to life. Things are happening. I begin to forget security and enjoy myself. There's lots of character to these claustrophobic alleyways. <laughs> it's a funny girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Saeed shows me some of the Kasbah's hidden gems, like the mosque of Sidi Abdel Rahman. Let's go in here. It's quite he was a 15th century holy man and patron saint of the city. A visit to his tomb is said to be particularly effective for women. Uh, some women, yeah. some women praying here yeah. uh, for Allah to give us more, to be merciful and to give us more, uh, to Allah bless us and to give us more rain because in Algiers we have a big problems. there is no more water. All right. Ironically, the prayers worked only too well. Within two weeks of our visit, hundreds were drowned in Algeria's worst flooding for years. By Saharan standards, the people who live in Algiers look quite prosperous. The oil fields see to it that the street markets are pretty well stocked. Look at the size of those braziers. <laughs> My goodness me. <laughs> Get a couple of footballs in yeah. there. I might just pick up a couple. <laughs> Next morning, it's time to leave Alger La Blanche, the white city, as the French called it. There's a train that goes west to Oran, but I've been warned the line is dangerous, so I seek professional advice. Is it okay to travel on the train? I know there are security problems. Yes, there are security, but, but, but I, not problem right? in train. Yes, yes, it's not problem in train. You can go in at or on or Constantin or Annaba. It's a security. It's not problem for you. Okay. 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 That's good. How do you, sp you, you speak English so well? How, is this yeah, something they teach you on the yeah, it's, Algerian it's, railway? It's English of school. It's oh. my English of school. But yeah. uh, when we like a language. We practice it very good at that top. So what is your job here? My job is master station. Yeah. Station master? Yeah. Not station mistress, station master. Yeah. I'm the first uh, lady in Algeria. Really? In the station oh. of Algeria, yes. Okay. station is very clean, I noticed. Yeah, it's very, very absolutely tight. It's a woman who is master <laughs> station, I think. And it's a policeman who's following us. The train is about to leave, and it's time to say farewell to Saeed, who's shown me that despite the dire warnings, the people of Algiers could not have made us feel more welcome. Yeah. Anyway, Michael, Saeed, have a good thanks. Trip. Excellent. Thanks have for everything. Trip. Fantastic time. We'll see you soon. Inshallah. Okay. Bye bye. pull out, everything looks normal enough, but in Algeria it's never wise to be complacent. The Algiers-Oran line does have a history, and I'm certainly not allowed to ride it unprotected. OK. 
okay? Ah. Is there a security problem on this line? Yes, there. The more, yes, there is, and there has been over the last ten years. This is uh, an area to the south of Algiers, uh, in a known as uh, the Triangle of Death. We are approaching Blida, yeah. and uh, this has been the most bombed uh, railway line in the world in the you know over the last uh, ten years. What sort of form does that take? Do people attack the train, ambush? What, yeah, what, the, what the train. On? This train here has been bombed. Uh, it, it has been stopped by people coming onto the train and pulling the communication cord, which is yeah. why you won't find a communication cord on this train at the moment. Really? They, and, they yeah. took them out because uh, what, 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 was, what was the problem? People were well, yeah, you'd, you'd get um, confederates of the uh, you know of terrorist groups who'd come onto the train masquerading as uh, as passengers. They'd pull the communication cord at a mm. certain moment. The train would stop. And the uh, terrorists would come onto the train and uh, you know commit acts of, uh, of yes, cruelty right. and, uh, and barbarism. What they take take people uh, take people's lives. Yes, on they the train. would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in uh, awful circumstances that we really don't want to go into. Uh, now, however, over the last couple of years, uh, you will find as you're going along there is a you know a major security presence, and uh, yeah. you won't you will not uh, really run. The same risk, or so we're, or so we're told. Yeah, yeah. But you don't see many foreigners on a. No, line I would. Like I this. well, I in my consideration, you're probably the first foreigner to pass along this line in in, in the last yeah. ten years. I have to say, so far it's, it seems to be fine. The train left on time. It was very friendly. Even the countryside at the moment is kind of like sort of farmland. I mean, I wouldn't well, want to put people off coming to Algeria because we've had no problems really at all. People have been extremely friendly. I know we've been guarded by you and, and uh, other people, but I don't feel there's been any hostility. Uh, no, there's so no far. hostility from the general population. They're very welcoming people, as you, know, yeah. as you, as you would no doubt have seen as you've been going through here. Even at stations like Schleff, where violence has been rife, there's an unthreatening air of ordinariness. But the hard fact remains that in the last 10 years of terror and counter-terror, 100,000 people have been killed. One thing you won't actually be able to see um, on our journey is the presence of the armed guards. We have quite a heavy security presence, uh, both from Algiers and then uh, a town called Schleff, where we stopped. And they changed the guard round and 18 members of the Gendarmerie Nationale, armed with AK-47s, came aboard to look after us. So uh, they obviously don't want to be filmed. It's dangerous for them. But uh, the train is actually bristling with guards looking after us. The train used to be exotically known as the Algiers Casablanca Express, but tensions between Algeria and Morocco over security have closed the railway border, and now the train terminates at Oran. The army can go home now, I'm someone else's responsibility. Great station. Absolutely beautiful. Mm. Moresque. Is this an Iran important city? Yes, yeah, the second second import, uh, second city of Algeria. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Now, where are we head? Off down here? It looks like it, yeah, yeah. straight into the centre of the town. Oran, like Algiers, is still steeped in French influence. Bare breasted northern maidens gaze down from the opera house sharing the square with a carved likeness of Arab nationalist hero Abdul Qadr. The confusion reflects my own feelings as I near the end of the journey. This is the last big city on my journey and you can't get much further west in Algeria than this, so I've now got to think hard about how I'm going to get back home.
I'm able to bypass the closed border with Morocco by taking a roundabout ferry route into Ceuta. From there it should be easy enough to get back across the Straits to Europe. Ceuta is a curiosity. It's a slice of Spanish territory clinging to the coast of Africa. It's surrounded by Morocco, and in the same way that the Spanish want Gibraltar, the Moroccans would rather like Ceuta. But there's no sign of Spain parting with it. Indeed, this lovingly preserved monument in the Plaza Africa commemorates a Spanish invasion of Morocco. The Spanish presence makes Ceuta a magnet for those wanting to get out of Africa. High on a hill above the town is one of the outlying defences of Fortress Europe, a holding centre for immigrants, built and run by the European Union. It's bright, clean and modern, and people here can't wait to get out. There are nearly 400 men, women and children in the centre, but only 45 applications have been processed in the last six months. The inmates are restless, some are desperate, but they're not giving up, not after the risks they've taken to get this far. And where, do you, where, where have you come from? You've come from... From Nigeria. Yeah. yeah. And how did you get here? Through the Sahara, Sahara Desert, from here. On, um, on a vehicle? With leg. On foot, you walked yeah, through the Sahara? Yeah, yeah. How long did that take? It took me almost one year. How, how did you get here then, into Ceuta? Into Ceuta, I passed through Sahara, get to Morocco, from Morocco I come to this place. How did you get here from Morocco? From Morocco. Because this is a fortress, this is all... Yeah, big yeah I passed through the, the, through the barbed wire. Through the, did uh, you? The, bar, the barbed wire. Yeah. With a flyer, with a, a fishing boat. I came by the boat. Came by boat yeah. out into the sea, and that brings you up onto the shore. Here. Yeah. Did you have to pay somebody a lot of money to get here? Yeah, but the boat will pay about one thousand five hundred to reach here. Five one thousand five hundred dollars. Yeah. Dollars. Yeah. U.S. dollars. Yeah. At the narrowest point of the Straits of Gibraltar, only nine miles separate these people from their goal. I'm lucky. I can cross the Straits in an hour on a scheduled ferry in broad daylight. But thousands of Africans will pay good money to be brought over in unsuitable boats at dead of night. Belinda Braithwaite, who has a house close to where they land, knows only too well that many will never reach the beaches of Europe alive. They tend to come across when it's very, very calm in the middle of the night, but with the straits, you can suddenly get a squall in the middle of the night and, and they're halfway across and they've got too many people in the boat. None of them can swim. Um, and they don't have any life jackets, so the boat capsizes, and so they poor get, things are um, thrown into the sea. Do they have any sort of navigation? I presume they've got to come along here with no lights or lamps. Is it always at night? Well, it's always at night, and in a way, some of the worst casualties happen when it's a foggy night, because it would appear that some of the more unscrupulous skippers um, sort of say, "Well, it's." 200 yards over there jump out here yeah. and in fact it's more like a mile so uh, the poor people um, find that they're out of their depth and can't swim but uh, you know you imagine if you're a pregnant woman thrown over the side of a boat you don't stand a chance so and when, worse they, when they do get ashore I mean this is what the, the, the boat here sort of obviously been pulled up against the rocks there's great holes in it what happens when they when they get to the shore. They scatter as quickly as they can um, and disappear into the pine forest. But obviously, if they've just got out of a boat or maybe they've had to swim the last bit, their clothes are completely sopping wet. So they tend to bring with them, uh, well, there you are, look, a little um, plastic. What, is that something from... Uh, off, off well, I think it looks remarkably like it's been sort of bound up to keep it waterproof. Yeah. Um, and they would then keep some dry clothes in there, yeah. and you see like here, you've got the fellow's oh clothes that he's actually taken off. Um, well, they take these and, off because uh, they're yeah. I mean, sodden and, and they have clothes with them. and bits and pieces and his water Good bottle. Lord. Yeah, so it's someone from and, uh, Morocco, Then he'll just Mali. quickly get away before he's spotted. 
So there's clothes all over these dunes, sort of scattered yes, about. Yes, but I mean, they, uh, what amazes me is that sometimes, you know, I come across them. When at last I reach Gibraltar, the flags are flying and the day trippers are filling the streets. But there's something different in the air. A smell of betrayal. Your Excellency, may I have you leave to secure the fortress, sir? After nearly 300 years, the unthinkable is happening. Britain and Spain are discussing joint sovereignty. The ceremony of the keys dates back to the days when the gates of the citadel were locked every night. Your Excellency, the fortress is secure and all swell, sir. But how secure is the fortress? Good night, sir. Good night. Suddenly, this harmless ceremony seems loaded with significance. It's more than just an entertainment. Will the gates of Gibraltar have to be locked again? When I set out, I always thought of Gibraltar as the bridge between Europe and Africa. But now I've finished the journey, I think what's more important for the future is that the Sahara is the bridge from Africa into Europe. There is a danger in becoming obsessed with our own security. There may be enemies at the gate, but locking them out may only create more enemies. I think the best hope for the future is to look around the gate, to find out more, not less, of how other people live. After all, this time a year ago, I thought the Sahara was empty.